Boom, we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to the LAC YouTube channel. And I thank all of you for being here wherever you may be. And of course, however you may be listening. I have an awesome guest today, Andrew Wilson, a.k.a. Big Papa Fascist. I'm very grateful for him uh, coming on the channel. Uh, I was told that Andrew is almost willing to go on any channel, and I can absolutely attest that that's true. So I'm I'm very grateful. Um, by the way, if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button, like, comment, share. You guys know the drill. And without further ado, let's dive into this. So Andrew, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing well, doing well. So uh, I wanted to start here with you. Um, so my understanding... Uh, for, for you kind of religiously. So I believe you're Orthodox like myself. And from what I've seen in the past, you were Protestant like I am, or I used to be as well. So can you take me through kind of your uh, conversion process and just kind of how you found Orthodoxy and uh, talk a little bit about that? So yeah, it's, it started through uh, inquiry. Actually, my wife came across it before I did. And, um, she started listening to, uh, I think some Jay Dyer and some other things. Yeah. And, um, she told me that we should look into it. And of course I immediately dismissed her opinion and told her, no, I don't, I don't give a shit about any of this. You know what I mean? It's worthless to me. Uh, but she was pretty adamant that I at least look at it. And so finally, almost as a placation, I did, I said, okay, fine. I'll look into it. I will. I'll do it. I'll look into it. That was it, man. Once I started yeah. to dive into it, uh, there was really no going back for me. That's really cool to hear. Yeah, my mine was very similar to that. I, you know, I was raised Protestant. My grandmother actually, though, she's from uh, Spain, so she uh, was raised Catholic. But when she came here to America, you know, the the Protestant Protestantism absolutely took shape. And for for me. I had only had, I've said this on my channel a few times, I had only had access to one Orthodox person, like knowingly, uh, in my life up until seeing some Jay Dyer clips. And then, you know, of course, I saw some of your content and just kind of all of the of the Orthodox fear. You know, I, I wish I had had exposure uh, much sooner. Uh, but you know, that's just how things work some, sometimes. And for me really, you know, I got chrismated a couple months ago. I really just my whole life, you know, cause I think this is the case a lot with, with Protestants, my whole life, I was really, um, you know, my family was traditional. Uh, we did respect history, but in the Protestant faith though, it kind of, that kind of was not the case. And, you know, I always say Protestantism, while it's Christian, I would say it's a very liberal form of Christianity. And, you know, I was always searching for that. And as soon as I came across, you know, Jay Dyer's content, your content, you know, this, I would say that this was a year or two ago and it really just, uh, grabbed a hold of me and the rest of it, the rest is history. So, um, for orthodoxy, would you say that those kind of like the historicity, the traditional aspects, those types of things were what kind of, uh, uh, drew you to orthodoxy as well, or, or kept you, um, uh, going with orthodoxy? Uh, well, for me, it was logical first. Yeah. So, um, faith came second, which I'm, I'm, I think for many people, it's the opposite. Um, yeah. so I had a struggle with that for a while, uh, whether or not that was even okay. Am I in this for the wrong reasons? Because I know it's true, but, uh, I know it's true absent faith, which defeats the purpose <laughs> right? that defeats the purpose. Yeah. Um, but the truth is, is the, the more I dove into it, the more I recognize that many, many, many people, many people. Uh, come into this through um, kind of logic and reason first. And I don't I think that there's any wrong way uh, that um, that God moves you into something. I don't think that there is a wrong way for that to happen necessarily. So yeah. uh, even though that might've been my path, I understand it's not the path of many, um, but definitely it was a logical appeal, which happened first, not uh, not the contrary, interestingly enough. Well, that's, that's awesome. I was going to, um, so I went to, uh, I went on Grace Thorpe's channel. <laughs> I'd done a few videos on, on her, um, 
you know, on, on kind of the stuff going on there. And I, I know you've had her on your channel too. And, um, the dad said, when I went on the panel said that, uh, Orthodox guys are kind of like straight edge, like goody, goody two shoe, which of course I, I take as a compliment myself, but to tell you the truth, Andrew, I, I don't really think that that's fully true. I think a lot of Orthodox, uh, including yourself are totally willing to engage in kind of secular ideas and combat them and discuss them. You know, I, I said to Ben, you know, if you look at the the really influential Orthodox individuals, you know, they're totally willing to drop a F-bomb here, here or there, you know. Um, and that's kind of, I think, just an aspect of, of Orthodoxy that's different from uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. So uh, I just wanted to, I just kind of wanted to bring that up and see what you think about that, about um, Orthodox people, I guess, kind of being uh, straight edge, kind of goody goody type stuff. Uh, well, it's bullshit. So <laughs> there's like, let, let's just kind of unequivocally say that it's bullshit nonsense. And it, it has essentially always been uh, bullshit nonsense, right? Yeah. So get you up here and me at the same time. There we go. Oh, nice. Yes. Okay. So he said that Orthodox people basically need to loosen up. They're, they're goody, goody kind of straight edge. And I told him, I said, I, you know, I didn't think that that was true. Um, you know, I think Orthodox people, and this is why Orthodoxy is growing is because we are willing to engage with kind of the, uh, modern debate topics and combat them and things like that. And, you know, we'll, we'll throw the best F bombs with, with the best of them. So that's, that's what I was asking about. Yeah. Well, so just so that you unequivocally kind of understand my position here, the Thorps are completely retarded. And so <laughs> I don't take anything that they say seriously. Right. I don't believe that they're serious people. I think that they are fame hunters I agree, and that they have no ulterior motive other than uh, to hunt for clout and hunt for fame. And I think that they are pretty unapologetic about that. So I literally don't give a shit about what their opinions are about anything ever. <laughs> no, I, I would agree with that. I, I really would. Uh, and I've had the same impression myself. Uh, I, you know, we'll see. I, I may have uh, great, I would be open to having Grace on the channel just to dive deeper, but I am kind of hesitant because I, I tend to agree with you. So uh, moving on here from orthodoxy, I wanted to, you know, ask you about that. And I think you provided a good answer there. So recently, Paul Joseph Watson, I saw a video of his and he was discussing um, the video topic was about T Tucker Carlson and his recent prediction. So um, Tucker Carlson, apparently on the Adam Carolla show, uh, predicted that the United States will try to be in open war with Russia in the coming year. What do you think of that? Do you think that that's true? Any validity to that? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad to it's it's sad to say it. I I, I mean, at least true. there's I a think, at least um, there's a massive there's yeah. a massive possibility of this. Right. The, the thing is, is that Russian Russia being a sovereign nation, which is now maybe one of the few nations left, which is trying to uphold any sort of what we would consider to be traditionalism, has a heavy Orthodox presence, which is there. Not to say that everything is peaches and cream there, because it's not, and there's all yeah. kinds of problems with the uh, with the nation. Uh, but they seem like they're almost, in a way, a globalist holdout. Yeah, right? they I agree. seem like they're almost a globalist holdout. And so, no, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if you saw um, kind of the current trend move towards uh, some kind of open war with Russia. It's a huge mistake. Napoleon's made the mistake. Many people have made the mistake of trying to do an open land war with Russia, uh, and they've paid the price for it dearly. Uh, but it it would not surprise me, and uh, I would say that that Carlson's at least on the right path. On the other hand, you have to take into consideration that pandering, um, you know, towards the kind of warmongering effort, and that also brings in clicks and views. And so you'll see this with Tim Pool a lot. Tim Pool is always yeah. saying we're on the verge of civil war every single day uh, that goes by. You know, the United States is right there. We're on the knife's edge. He's been saying it for years. So you have to take some of it with a grain of salt. Right. But do I think that a move like that? Uh, over the next year or in the coming years is inevitable. I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's really, uh, sad to see, you know, I, I think that that was a great answer for me. I, you know, I have been conservative my entire life, 
but I think early on, you know, I kind of was more towards the boomer type of conservatism, more neoconservatism. Uh, but were. as I got we all, older, we all you, know, you really start, especially when Trump really rose to power, you really start to see that um, there aren't necessarily th this whole dichotomy of Republican versus Democrat. I'm not sure is a le uh, totally legitimate dichotomy. Um, I think that ultimately it, and this is why Trump was able to be so, so successful because he talked about this, which is that ultimately it's the establishment, the elites versus the people. And I think with Russia and Ukraine, uh, we saw this with, uh, getting out of Afghanistan, you know, you, you just really see this kind of establishment take that just kind of comes forth and uh, you see people just supporting the newest thing. Um, but I do also agree with you that you do have to take it with a grain of salt. At the end of the day, we have to just live our lives and you know just try to be good citizens. So my next question here is, uh, has America turned into a country completely against its citizens, in particular, productive, non-law-breaking -law citizens? Yes. Yeah. But the, uh, the groundswell for american socialism which is now taking the forefront from academia uh, that's a necessary consequence of egalitarianism yeah. and the push towards egalitarianism is to punish those with to give to those without and then they kind of do this this is why the push against christianity is uh is so harsh because from their standpoint they want to co-opt the message of jesus christ into give all of your shit to poor people Right? right. And that was not the message, nor the moral message, nor the point of Christianity is to give all your shit to poor people. That's not what it's about, but that's what the socialists are trying to co-opt it into. And uh, when, as you see Christians push back against that message, the persecution of them has drastically increased and it's going to continue to increase until it hits critical levels. Right. Uh, that is going to be in our lifetime within the next 10 years that you start seeing these critical levels. As Christians, especially remember that they have boycott power and that they have yes. the power of the most enormous, the most enormous institution in the United States, which is the churches, these various churches. Protestant churches are extraordinarily powerful. People right. forget that. Uh, the Orthodox Church, that's going to be a long ways away, maybe 60, 70 years before there's a real power bank there, but that's coming. The Catholic Church has already begun a groundswell, and you see young Zoomers all over the internet really trying to push Catholicism in a big way. So this this whole uh, kind of Protestant stranglehold on allowing the secular church and state, that's going by the wayside, and we're going to see more and more of that in our lifetime. Yeah, you know, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I can, you know, really attest this myself being a young guy. You know, when I move towards orthodoxy, the amount of of especially young guys my age that were moving towards uh, orthodoxy was just astonishing. And I think it has a lot to do with what you just touched upon here. Um, and, you know, it, it for me, it was just really great to be a part of and kind of go move into that. But ultimately, I would also add that I think a lot of people are searching for meaning, especially men, they're searching for purpose. Um, and and kind of something to hold on to. And I think the Orthodox Church really does provide that. But um, just kind of staying along the lines of Tucker Carlson here, uh, and uh, I wanted to move it to Trump. Um, so kind of what is your take on Trump? For me, I... You know, I kind of see him as a as a necessary individual, and you know, ultimately, um, I want anything that kind of diminishes the establishment. Uh, I would say when Trump was president, unfortunately, he kind of moved towards the establishment, but during his campaign, that was not the case. So I think that you know, for the most part, I would say he's a necessary tool. That's kind of what Steve Bannon would refer to him as uh, an imperfect tool. Um, but you know, and I always point this out, and I think people get mad at me on my channel. He did fail. Mm -hmm. Uh, to hold up a lot of his promises. So I just was curious what kind of where you see Trump right now. What are your thoughts on on him personally? So of all people who had the best take on the Trump phenomenon, it was Michael Moore. Big, fat, disgusting Michael Moore. But Michael Moore beat yeah. feet all over 
the city streets of some of the most god awful cities in Michigan that you could ever imagine, which were his home stomping ground, including Detroit and Flint, and went to the other under underbelly as you were an element. He was told often that he should not put himself in documentaries, and he was a trendsetter for doing that because he put mm. himself in his own documentary. So everything was from the perspective of progressive Michael Moore. But what he learned as he was beating feet and talking to these various hundreds of people uh, as he was trying to push his progressive, disgusting message was, hey, there's a fucking problem here. The disparity between the people who are on the street and the working class and these types of people and right. the elite class is such that their mindsets don't even they're not even in the same universe. OK, he predicted that Trump absolutely would win. Uh, yes. On the populist message, just like uh, Ann Coulter and many others who understood the Steve phenomenon yep. of of taking the hand grenade proverbially, pulling the pin and throwing it in at the political class and watching them explode. The point of the Trump phenomenon had nothing to do with clearing the swamp out, even though that's something that, um, like like you said, that's that's part of like um, you know the rhetoric and all of this type yeah. of thing. The point of the Trump phenomenon was for us to throw a hand grenade in and just yes. basically voice our displeasure and tell them that we hate all of you. You're all a bunch of fucks. You can all go straight to hell. We wish that you know what I mean. That was yeah. the working class cry. Was like, go to hell, you sons of bitches. Yeah. Stop everything up for us stop it you know what i mean yeah and you saw the political class's reaction to this was to do everything it could to persecute and mercilessly and still to this day destroy any credibility that this guy ever could have right. lest another one comes to power and fruition yeah and it, you know andrew it really happened on both sides you know a lot of conservatives forget when Trump was moving forth and really kind of uh leapt ahead of the field the Republican Party was trying to do anything they could, including Fox News, to make it so he was not the nominee. And again, I think that that's just an example of kind of what you're talking about here. Uh, and ultimately, uh, this really was a, a statement about the working class, the people who make this country run. Uh, and that's why I wanted to, uh, that's why I asked you the question about if uh, America has turned against. Uh, its citizens and especially the ones that are productive. Um, well, but, citizens, yeah. America's citizens have turned against each other. True. There is there is no more commonality between uh, you. You may now you may call this the fake left right dichotomy, right? And my wife and me off, often get into this because I agree in the one sense that there is a fake pro wrestling style dichotomy which happens in front of the public. You can clearly see. That it's one of those things where I'm on the top ropes and I'm going to take you down and then afterwards we're all going to go to dinner, right? right? And definitely that happens within the political class. But it's the culture that you really have to look at. And yes. the dichotomy which exists between the left and the right is so polarizing at this point that there is no commonality. I don't have any commonality with somebody who believes in these kind of egalitarian, right. uh, the egalitarian messaging. I don't have any commonality with people who believe in feminism. I have no commonality with people who are trying to preach the pro LGBTQ stuff. I have no commonality with these people and I can't None. find common ground with people who then say, and on top of that, because you don't believe these things, you're so psychotic. You can't even have a gun to personally protect yourself. Right. You can't have, you know, you can't have any of these things. And some of these are like birthright things, you know what I mean? And they do everything that they can to gaslight, destroy, and make you believe that the things which you hold dear and true, they'll shit on every single symbol that we have and then say, well, but we're not, I'm not touching you, though, like yeah. a little kid, right? I'm not touching you, though. I'm not touching you as you destroy everything that we hold dear. You pull down every symbol that we care about. You destroy everything that we hold as valuable. And then you say, but we're, we're doing it all within the confines of the law and you're a psychopath right. for having any resistance to this. That's bullshit. And it that's is. what's going on. And it's been going on for my entire lifetime, even though I didn't recognize it for many years like many people didn't, because it's really difficult to put the pieces together. And I still don't have them all together. Nobody right. does. But yeah, there's a culture war, which is no longer an undercurrent, but it is now dragging into the street like it did with Black Lives Matter and many of these other types of progressive. These are all communist progressive led movements. And yeah, and unfortunately, it is now moving in to this kind of next stage. Um, 
And there's either going to be, you know, renaissance or the alternative is going to be very bad. So I'm really pushing more towards renaissance than yes. the alternative. Really well said, Andrew. Absolutely, it is coming to the surface. And the, the thing that is the most crucial is just the American public has been shat on so much that I'm just not sure how much longer it can hold on. I, I don't even think it's uh, being held on. I think it's boiling to the surface, as you said. So let me ask you this, Andrew. I've seen uh, old videos of uh, William F. Buckley, which of course I am not the type of conservative that he is. I'm a paleo conservative, a Christian nationalist like yourself. Uh, but That's awesome, man. We need uh, yes. you. Like we need, we yeah. really do. Like I, I, I desperately put this plea out. That's why I do these these Discord calls almost nightly. We right. Do these Twitter spaces every chance that we get, talking to thousands upon thousands of people. The reason that this is done is because we need all of you. We need every Absolutely. single one of you. We can't have any of you on the sidelines. We need all of you right behind us uh, as we're as we're going. And I need this message to be transcendent to any orchestrator of it. So whoever's orchestrating the, the Christian nationalist message coherently, that's yeah. the person I'm willing to follow. Right. You know what I mean? We, yeah. it's, it, we desperately need it. But uh, so I'm yes, glad glad to see you glad to see you on uh, on that side of things. But anyway, go I ahead. Absolutely, dude. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. And, you know, uh, you would definitely be an individual that has uh, influenced me. Um, I would say that for me personally, that really happened the last couple of years, because I think for most conservatives, kind of the the what happens is you're more in the mindset of like a, like a Ben Shapiro and like, a, you know, those types of conservatives, a William F. Buckley. But so going back to William F. Buckley, I've seen videos of his and th there's a few things I've noticed. Number one, it did seem like they were far more engaging and willing to discuss really, really tough topics. Like some of the individuals that have been on his channel are like really extreme individuals that I'm just not sure could exist uh, these days. Uh, but they couldn't. With with William, though, uh, it seems like the topics and the ideas that are discussed are still, and I, I mean, I'm talking all the way back to the 1960s, late 1960s, 70s on his show. A lot of the topics are similar to the topics that we're talking about today. So do you think that it has changed that much or are we still fighting the battle that, that has been going on since the 60s, I would say, or maybe even before that? No, we're in brand new territory. So yes, sir, there was a start there, but these people had an ethical system, which was handed down from the greatest generation and the greatest generation right. from the World War I generation. And they had a huge advantage, especially boomers had a huge advantage in the accumulation of wealth from these people who came back and they, they were the beneficiaries of the GI Bill. They were the beneficiaries right. of an economy, which allowed a singular working man and, uh, to take care of an entire family. And feminism had not enroached to the point yet where the degradation of the family unit was such that we now have an entire generation of men who have been raised by single women, yes. which has created uh, a basic, basically uh, the society has begun to abort itself literally abort itself. Yes. So no, this generation has massive disadvantages that previous ones did not have. It right. has some advantages. The big advantage that it has is the, the problems are not something which can be hid from anymore, suppressed by media because of the technological venues that are now available yeah. to everybody like the one we're on right now, where we can stream everywhere at all times and tens of thousands of voices can say, no, listen, this is bullshit and it is happening. Right. And it's a serious problem. You yeah. have men right now can't get married because they feel like they can't afford a house. Right. They can't buy a house until they're 30 years old. People usually marry close to their age bracket. So they marry a woman. She's 28. A lot of her best childbearing years are behind her already. They're right. starting families later and later and later. So, no, it's uh, this is a highly disadvantaged uh, position for Zoomers to be in to be fighting this uh, this battle. The only thing we have on our side is the information highway. Right. And utilizing that to the best of our ability. And the the fight is on every single conceivable front. Everything from ban the ADL, which is being fought about on Twitter right this second, though it's probably destined to lose. It is still a fight which is happening. The other side is you have the feminist fight. You have every single conceivable cultural fight going on simultaneously all at once. 
and all of us are on different fronts, but we are fighting the same war. Yeah. And so it's far better for us to have a hands-off approach towards other conservatives and let them attack those fronts, even if you're not able to, or even if you have mild disagreements, because at this point, the pushback and the pendulum is swinging and we need to be on the forefront doing our part. Right. Yeah. Well, really well said. Um, you know, I just thought about this while when you uh, over the course of what you said, you know, a lot of like I'll see on the manosphere, these girl or some of these girl or women rather saying that. Um, so it is quite <coughs> different. You're, you're absolutely right. It is different in a lot of regards in the challenges that we are facing. Um but I'll see a lot of these women say that it's weird for for men to uh, like, uh, you know, an 18 to, you know, 20, 23 year old uh, chick. But it's like, ultimately, because of the way things are, guys are not going to be able to accumulate the resources until far later. And really, that's the only dichotomy that is presenting itself you know so i think that that's and all of those same chicks absolutely will be willing to date you know a 30 plus year old guy if he has you know the uh the resources and i guess authority that that they're that they find attractive but that was just a, a side well, most note. people all have, um, have yeah, always ahead. dated even though women do or men do date younger women right it's usually between like four or five years something yeah. in there these aren't extreme gaps but even when you see what's considered an extreme gap or what somebody might consider an extreme gap, like a 41-year-old man uh, gets married to a 19-year-old girl, who gives a shit? Right. Literally, totally not agree. only do I not give a shit, right, but I would encourage this to happen. It provides yes. massive security for the young woman, right? And it gives the man a straight-up breeding factory, right? Yes. A it just up works. Factory. It works, Andrew. Not only, not only does it work, but here, let me give you the tell-all. And this is a, the most uncontroversial statement on planet Earth that people still take controversy with, and I have no idea why. Yeah, Men like to have sex with young, hot women. Right. Exactly. What do you want me to say? Like, what, what, more, what more can I say about this? All men that so I've true. ever met in my life really 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 want to have sex with young hot women i don't know right. I, I don't know how else i can possibly put that and every man i say that to says well yeah <laughs> yeah that's true and you yeah. know who else says that that's true the young hot women right so it's like what do you want me to say here there's no there's no this is the descriptive is which is a truism and uh, people need to 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 deal with it that doesn't mean lower yeah. the age of consent you shouldn't do that at all maybe even right. raise it to 90 i don't care but what i will say is this yeah, young, beautiful women in prime breed stock. I mean, men want it, want, they want them. And it's like, yeah. I'm not going to discourage that. And it makes a lot of sense from the purview of raising the population. We should be encouraging such relationships, uh, at the very least, not stigmatizing them. Yeah, it's just mind blowing these days how many, like, um, truths or what we thought were truths like th this kind of uh societal these kind of societal truths that nowadays are are being debated you know like a uh you know for example can can a man be a woman and and that type of stuff which i do want to return to that because you have a really good argument for that um but there's just all these like things that all previous generations took for granted as truths that we are arguing about. And it's absolutely insane. This is the order of things. Um, but Andrew, I wanted to ask you about, uh, so Ann Coulter, I'm sure you're aware, I've done some videos about her. Um, she really, you know, supported Trump. Trump got a lot of his uh, arguments from her. Uh, but I wanted to specifically ask you recently, and I would say probably the last like year, she has been saying that DeSantis uh, will be the nominee. Trump will not get the nomination. Uh, and so I just wanted your take on that. What do you, what do you think about Anne kind of having that take? The take is not incorrect. The likelihood that Trump is actually the Republican nominee when they're trying to get him off of every single ballot possible and he's under yeah. criminal indictment seems to become less and less daily. However, it's a fundamental mistake. So that's the descriptive is. But what ought to be is that it's a fundamental mistake to do this. DeSantis cannot beat Joe Biden. DeSantis could probably not beat anybody. The, even the next Democrat that he has to face off against in his own state, he probably wouldn't be able to take him on and beat him. Maybe. Maybe he could. But uh, yeah. but he's not he's not a great candidate for this. 
No. He's not going to do well against Biden. And he's part of the same entrenched political elite that the now disenfranchised Republican base, which has become the dissident right, fucking hates. They absolutely yes. love them. They want nothing to do with them. They want another Trump in the worst way or anybody pushing populism. So while Coulter may have a good point here, um, this is not what people what people want, though it may end up, you know, being what they get. Yeah, absolutely. And and Trump is absolutely surging in the polls uh, right now. So, you know, currently she just is not she just is not on point with that. And I think a lot of it has to do with her, you know, just being kind of upset that Trump was not able to, she kind of, you know, looked like an idiot in some regards because of how much she supported Trump and, uh, you know, s certain things did not get done. So I, I could see her dissatisfaction, but uh, but with regards to DeSantis, uh, Trump is absolutely in the lead. So when well, you have to remember that, that Ann Coulter. Are, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, you have to good. remember that Ann Coulter wrote a pivotal book uh, called Adios America. I don't know if you ever read yes. the book. Yes, I've okay? read that. But inside of that book, based on her research, she actually demonstrated that the illegal migration problem to the United States was tenfold what was being reported, as well as the overstayed visa crisis, which we were facing, and that the demographic shift would be such that we would never be able to recover unless somebody did something about it immediately. Even Trump coming into office as Coulter supported this. Uh, it was was too little too late and she knew it, but she was hoping that at least with the wall and staunch immigration policies, some of this could be stemmed so that there could still be a nation that was worth saving. But right. Trump did not deliver. So, of course, yes. Coulter is so pissed off she can't see straight because she saw that as the pivotal front to the culture war, which it was. It's it just was. a portion of the culture war, which has now been forever lost. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That hit the nail on the head there. So um, I just wanted to ask you, Andrew, there's two arguments that uh, I've heard you make that I think are absolutely excellent. Let me get my iPad here. <laughs> it's uh, so one of them and I'm, you know, I'm not doing it justice verbatim, but it, I have the spirit of it. Um, one argument that you make is true feminism or living in a world with females as the leaders is impossible because men provide and defend the rights of women. Yes. If men say 20% tomorrow decided to get rid of feminism, it could be done and there would be no more feminism. Now, of course, you could put democracy in there in replacement of feminism. That's correct. But it, but it really just shows the argument. No, that's all correct. So the yeah. you, And I think you do have the spirit of the argument. It actually doesn't matter what the system is. Men are the creators of all systems of governance. They're the creators of all systems of inference. They're the creators of all systems of logic. They're the creators right. of all systems of everything. Absolutely. And the ultimate reason that they have to be the arbiters of all of these things is because they have the dominion use of force and women cannot compete with that use of force. And so ultimately, uh, they're always going to be at the whims of men, whether they want to or not, Whether even, even whether that ought be true or not true from a moral perspective doesn't actually matter because the descriptive is, is always going to be true. There is no way around it. You could pump the entire population of men globally full of estrogen for the next 20 generations <laughs> yeah. and it still would not take away the, the uh, delineation factor that men are the arbiters of force. Now, not just on women. They're the arbiters of force and have dominion over the animal kingdom, all of the plant life, the mountains, everything. They have complete and total dominion through the, the ultimate usage of force. So women Absolutely. have always been at our mercy. They've always been at our dominion. And they should really thank us because we have been quite benevolent. Men are quite benevolent to women because we prize them. We think that they're great. We think they're gorgeous. We want to do everything that we can yes. possibly do to give them nice, comfortable existences. However, they still need to adhere to the patriarchal structure or men will take all of that away, as you've seen done over and over. And for feminists, this is mind boggling to them that there's no refutation to this. They yeah. just can't even wrap their heads around the fact. But we live in a democracy. Yes, but if <laughs> men decide we don't live in a democracy, we don't. Right. But we live in a totalitarian dictatorship. And if men decide we no longer have that, we won't have that either. But women cannot unilaterally make those decisions, even collectively, because all the men have to do is say no, and there's nothing they can do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head that men deep down, and I always say this, men deep down want to provide and protect and have such great reverence 
for women, that it's just this animosity, it, the undertone of feminism, it could not be more incorrect. Men, by and large, do not wake up saying that they just want to bear down on women and hold authority over, uh, over all of them in a, in a uh, terrible manner. So it's just absolutely ridiculous. I love but I mean, that. Maybe we should. Yours like, and, but, but, but maybe and, we should. Um, I just, I haven't seen it beat yet. So, but maybe Andrew, we should that do is it. it for me. Yeah, go ahead. I was saying, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should show a society of what it's like for these feminists to live in a society where men don't revere them and are not kind to them. And you can see the kind of damage that men could actually do collectively. People haven't seen that shit. Yeah. They haven't seen it. Okay, in their lifetimes, you and I haven't, like yeah. I told you in DMs, like I tell everybody, I've, I'm always happy to help people's channels grow, always happy to see also um, people who have like-minded ideology, of which there's right. few, I'm glad to, uh, I'm actually glad to be here. So yeah, whatever, whatever you got, man, I'm here. Yeah, I, ju I just want to unequivocally say Andrew is a great sport and, and a really good guy. I appreciate that. So the last thing that we were discussing was I made the comment that, you know, fem the, the undertone of feminism is that men wake up in the morning and just want to suppress women, that they... Um, they have this sort of misogyny and this contempt and hatred for women. And as Andrew was alluding to, it just could not be further from the truth. Uh, men actually, I, I think honestly, Andrew, and while neither of us are Islamic, uh, and, and I will not pretend to know a ton about Islam, but just kind of my... Um, impression of of some of the arguments i've heard them make is that they have such great reverence a lot of their motivation and how they see see women they have kind of this reverence uh towards them um now i think it almost goes to the point of kind of uh almost simping a little bit but by and large i just think men really do want to do well for women and and do good towards them and and make them happy so I just, I, for me, my entire life, I have not understood uh, feminism. I, I think it's totally bullshit. Uh, and I think we're starting to see really the fruits of feminism's labor. Uh, Andrew, would you say that feminism is like one of the, the main issues that we're combating uh, today? I mean, if you had to rank it, would you rank it one, two, three? It's in the top three, yeah. Yeah. Feminism is pure poison. It's one of the most poisonous ideologies on planet Earth. And the fact that they've moved into and tried to co-opt Christianity to make it a part of feminism, they co-opt everything which is good and try to they try to invert the natural order. Literally, feminists try to invert what is obvious and what is true. So yes. men and women have a distinct essence between them. They really do. There is a distinction in you know at the ontological level between what um, what is a man and what is a woman. Right. And the, the thing that's so interesting about this question is that you see this played out cross culture. It doesn't matter where you are at any given time. Men have to operate in a spirit of cooperation for survival. That's right. Right. The reason that we enjoy each other's company and things like this, and we endlessly roast each other, we rib each other, and you'll see this everywhere on planet Earth at all times. If you trip and fall on your ass and I laugh at you, your ability to laugh at yourself, right, also yeah. is very helpful in dealing with that camaraderie. We're mean bastards at least seemingly from the women's standpoint. And yet women who tend to deal with each other in the nicest, kindest possible ways right. can't seem to maintain friendships worth a shit. How is it possible that men who seemingly are endlessly cruel to one another can have these deep and profound friendships with each other, but women who tend to move towards kindness as the absolute can't seem to maintain friendships at all? It's because yes. of this idea of cooperation. Women are very terrible at cooperating and they don't need to cooperate. They need to compete. Right. They're competing for resources. They're competing for their young. They are com in competition with each other. Yeah. Men, on the other hand, if we all uh, were in competition the same way women were, we'd be killing each other in the streets, right. literally There's murdering each other with wild yeah. abandon to try to get their women and get your resources. And what we figured out, though, is like, look, and Christian ethics always alludes to this as well. The spirit of cooperation for men is way, way better. And we all get what we want then. And you can build these amazing structures you could never do on your own. You could build these feats of engineering you could never do on your own. You could yeah. uh, get all sorts of access to resources you could never by yourself achieve 
through that cooperation. Women don't have to compete at that level. The only thing no. that women have to compete on is for the resources through men. So everything yes. can be individualized. Whereas men, we don't have that luxury. So we have to shit test each other all day long, yeah. every day. A shove here, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're a dork, you're retarded, you're this, you're that. And we find great humor in that yeah. uh, because that's what we're doing. We know what we're doing, right? Yeah, that's absolutely the case. You know, I, uh, you know, for my work, um, you know, because they, they always say that uh, uh, women are interested in people and guys are interested in things, but there there is overlap and, you know, uh, my background, my degrees are in psychology. I know you make fun of psychology oh, man. a lot, and largely you would. Be I have to correct. end this I interview if it's, if it's. I have to but end this I just interview wanted if it's to say that to bro. say <laughs> that in my field, obviously there are a, it's it got a lot of women uh, within it, and women tend to be very uh, passive aggressive with things. They tend to kind of go around issues rather than directly like men would. Um, and they are far more concerned with how things are said than what is said and uh, the, the information that is being included. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've heard, well, but you said it like this, you know, you said it like that. So, uh, but men have to be that way. Men have to have that directness so we get things done because we have the burden of performance. There is another argument though, Andrew, that, that you've made uh, and I really, really like this one. I want you to speak on it. Uh, so again, just it's it's in the it's in the spirit of it. The idea and arguments over transgenderism are mostly pointless as many people confuse sex and gender as a whole, ultimately debating whether a man can be a woman or vice versa as far as gender goes is silly because it is like debating whether a human can be a leprechaun. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the, that? So the conflation, which has occurred is one of the most wildly smuggled in premises that I've ever heard in my life, Yeah, which is that there's this elusive, this illusory thing, which exists called gender that nobody can pin down what it is. You can't taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it. Right. It does for all intents and purposes from a social construction standpoint, it literally does not exist. Right. Whatever we consider these feminine traits to be or masculine traits to be, Right. There's so much overlap between the two because the ontology between men and women is so similar. Yeah. Uh, I mean, case that, in point, Andrew, you see a ton of masculine women these days, honestly. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that also some of those masculine traits right. in women can be highly attractive. And sure. some of the feminine traits that, that, or what you might perceive as a feminine trait, like a man being kind to a child, that might be considered a feminine trait. But women tend to find that very attractive too, right? There yeah. can't, there's overlap across these things. There is no good foundation for gender at all. It literally does not exist, and it's not part of the human design or makeup or genome in any way, shape, or form. We have sex norms, and our biology is what produces the normalcy of the environment around us. It has nothing to do with gender. And yeah. that's why you'll see men and women basically operating under the same sex roles at all times in all places in history, regardless of circumstance, because yeah. there is nothing better. They, now, they say that we can transcend those because they're gender roles, but they're not. You are still confined to your biology. There is only sex. There has only ever been sex. The idea of gender as a construction is fucking absurd. Yes. Where anybody ever came up with this idea. Well, I know where it came from, right? But the fact that it's been smuggled in and the way that they smuggled this in was the, the was literally a category error. Yeah. You'll even see this in old video games where it says select your gender. They use <laughs> they yeah, use gender. True. They use gender as being interchangeable with sex. So yeah. most people are confused about it. So when you, they get a call on the phone and they say, "Well, what do you think about um you know, this gender or that gender, the person says, well, I have no problem with it because in their mind, they're making the category error that gender and sex mean the same thing. Right. And so what's ended up happening is this kind of mass widespread confusion where we're not even talking about the same thing anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not yeah. even having the same discussion. So one of the things that I think the crucible did really well to interject into the ethos is how to untangle that and turn the argument for gender right back around 
and throw it right back in their face. No, any of these things you claim is gender, I claim is sex. How can I be wrong? They can never tell you how they're wrong. Right. And so the thing is, it's like, no, that needs to go by the wayside. Um, and we're doing our part to stall that portion of the progressive argument. We're doing our yeah. part. Yeah, because most of the time, and and you know this, Andrew, when people, uh, you know, when they're talking about gender, that most of the time they are absolutely kind of confusing it with sex. But the specific debate, and this was just gold. Uh, you were, I, I don't know if it was a debate or or more of just a discussion, uh, but you were talking uh, with an individual that was transgender, and when it was asked to you. Uh, the, the individual was stunned by your answer and was not expecting it at all and really, really was was just gold. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, though, uh, Andrew, so you are, I would say, basically a professional debater. Um, when did you start to be or I guess start to realize that that debating was an interest of yours um, and would you consider it your purpose? Is, is that the thing that you are the most passionate about? Well, I got into it by accident so that you understand. Um, I guess I've always done debating, especially right. online, since there's been an online to debate on, but mostly on forums and things like that. It was not, it was something I did in leisure time. I'm an en engineer by trade. Yeah. Okay. The way that I got involved in this was I was uh, marketing. There was a, a political forum, which I was a part of, and the person who was at the head of it was basically dying. And so I didn't want the forum to die, even though there's only like 40 people on it. We were kind of like a small family. And so uh, I bought the forum and I thought maybe I can entice some people to come to this forum to, you know, it, it, this old school stuff like this, you're yeah. talking almost early 2000s tech that we're still trying to keep alive and in you know, 20, 2019, yeah. 2020. So I went to these different uh, Facebook groups and decided to market it there. And one of the Facebook groups that I went to to market this forum uh, was doing some you know politics on the Facebook group. And they started this little live show called Table Talk. And it was a terrible show, uh, very low production. It was just filled to the brim with these progressive scumbags. Yeah. And I would listen to them talk. And one night I said, why don't you let me come on because I'm sick of you bastards. And I went on and completely blew all of them out. It was it was a heinous, uh, brutal uh, a debate and a slug Brutality. And I just, yeah, it was, it was bad. Well, from there, they actually asked yeah. me to come back. And then I came back again. And then I came back again. And before you knew it, we started moving towards YouTube and actually having a show. So, right. I mean, I, I had no purpose towards this at all. My wife had done some online work and was part of some various online communities. And that didn't hurt uh, initially with the channel growth. But yeah. essentially, yeah, they were, there, was no, uh, there was no plan for this at all. I had no idea wow. that I would end up being a political entertainer, a uh, political debater, uh, or you know, uh, do social commentary. Uh, yeah. Especially never thought I'd get to the point where I did it for a living. Right. Uh, it, was, it was a complete and total fluke. So, uh, not something I planned whatsoever. <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. I mean, talk about God's uh, divine providence. But um, w would you call it a passion of yours now, though, uh, and part of your purpose as a man nowadays? Would you say so? I would. Yeah, I would say that uh, inside of this fear uh, that I can deliver some of the sharpest commentary and some Agreed. of the best, some of the best skilled rhetoric and logical argumentation towards the opposite side and keep it highly entertaining to maintain people's attention. I think I'm one of the best in the sphere at doing that. Yes. Uh, but what I think one of the advantages I had was um, because, because I came from you know the private sector. I didn't come from any entertainment family or background, none of that. Yeah. Uh, I took the job seriously. I, I thought of it like I would think of any other actual job that I wanted to be the best I possibly could be at it. So yeah. I practiced and still do practice for hours and hours and hours. I have conversations with people all over the world. I probe my own arguments. I probe their arguments. I try to keep myself as informed as possible, which is why when you bring up all these various different uh, things that you brought up, I can speak to them right. because I have practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. And I think most people don't do that. They don't consider the thing that they're doing uh, to be even worth practicing or worth yeah. uh, refining or anything like that. I had a guy, he sent me in after the debate that I had with Destiny, he sent in $100. He said, you continue 
to improve month after month after month. How are you doing that? And I said, because nobody else is, they're not practicing. They right. refuse to practice. They refuse to take L after L after L, even if it's just privately so that they can make sure that everything that they're saying is airtight. It makes the most amount of sense. They're not surprised by anything. I've right. heard this before. Oftentimes I can repeat an opponent's argument back to them before they've even made it because I've heard it so many times before. And it's like, that is, you, people should take the job of commentary seriously. They should yes. take the job of social commentary seriously. They should take political commentary and debating seriously if they want to really change minds. The other thing that I did was, again, maybe it's because private sector want to be good at the job, but I reinvested a lot into the show. Right. So as Super Chats and things like that came in, the first year and a half of the show, I didn't take anything. I worked my job 60 hours a week and would do the show after work and try to schedule things. It was a nightmare, but right. that's what I did before I was able to move to a more part-time position. Uh, and it was really difficult, but I took everything I had and reinvested it back in the show, back in the show, back in the show. So you saw the quality yes. tick up and tick up. And then I hired some staff and staff helps me with video editing and they help me with editing bits. And, um, you know, then I was able to get people to run discords for, for on behalf of yeah. the show. And it's like, it takes, it takes a team to really put it out. Uh, but you have to treat it like a real business and you yes. have to treat what you're doing like a real endeavor. Right. That's that's really, really well said. I, Andrew, I would absolutely say you are definitely one of the best debaters that that I've seen. And I'm and I'm talking about that includes, you know, people from the past, you know, who have been on William F. Buckley's show, you know, Christopher Hitchens, um, just just many prominent people, because nowadays with YouTube, somebody like myself really does have access to all of these people. And I would put you right up there. Uh, so what would you say? Because I have never, I mean, I have obviously had discussions and, and things like that. You know, in college, I, I did uh, some some debates. I remember we did um, a debate in um, my class, Psychology of Addiction. And the topic was whether drugs should be legal. I think specifically marijuana. Uh, and we were assigned the the which side we should be on. Um, so what would you say aside from uh, you know taking it seriously and and uh, caring about your commentary and and preparation, what would be some of the the traits that you think make a good debater? There's two, two primary traits. The first is don't be afraid of your own cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Do not be the cognitive dissonance is painful. It's physically painful and it's mentally painful. When you recognize that there's a roadblock in your ideology and your ideology necessarily has to shift or else you're living inside of, of contradiction, that is a painful experience for people Yes, to actually confront that and deal with that. So the first thing is don't be afraid of that. You're cutting out the dead wood. You're cutting out the rot. You're cutting out the disgusting stuff. You're cutting right. out the portions that you've been living with. And the reason it's so painful is because you feel like your whole life's a lie, right? Some of these things, yeah. you can literally come to the end of the road and go, I believed that for 20 years and operated like that was true for 20 years. Yeah. And it makes you feel like a fool. One of the biggest pitfalls that people have moving into these spheres is they're unwilling to confront their own cognitive dissonance and the fact that they could have conflicting viewpoints and things like that. That's the first one is don't be right. afraid of that and confront it as quickly as you can and cut that shit out. It's not just about consistency, but it's about you being able to believe what you're saying, be consistent with it and have there be no conflicts. And that's really, right. really hard. You have to run into a lot of things that, that are, are difficult. And then the second thing is don't be afraid to say these words. I don't know. Yes. If you ask a person about a topic especially if they're debaters or they're inside the sphere, things like that. And you say, listen, I don't know what this means. I, I don't have any conception of what it means. I don't really even understand the concept. Can you give me a hand? You'll be amazed at how many people left and right behind the scenes I help with debate uh, prep. My, my viewpoint is the more people on the left I help with debate prep, the more I can get them to see their ideological fallacies quicker, yes. right? And so that's good for me. And the more right. people I help on the right wing with debate prep, same thing, I'm going to be able to kind of subtly move them by showing them how some of their ideas are wrong. But don't be afraid to say, I don't know. 
right? There's tons yeah. of shit that I don't know that I'm asking for clarification on all the time. You'll hear me when I do these large discord groups, stop whole conversations for clarity. What does this mean? Right. You know, and I'm taking mental notes on all of that. So I think that the two prime things that keep the most amount of people down is, are those two things that they run into cognitive dissonance blocks that they can't get past. And they're terrified that if they say, I don't know, they're going to somehow lose credibility. Uh, just the broadcast before this, I was having a conversation with a guy who I consider a friend, PF Young, right? Uh, and told him, I understand that inside the framework I'm about to give you, it's not consistent. And I know that it's problematic and I'm still thinking about it. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to yeah. speak to it. I'm not going to like do a debate on that topic until I feel like that conflict is resolved. But I'm not afraid to say this is a problem. I know it's a problem and I know it needs to be dealt with. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to, I'm not going to run away from that. Right. Yeah. Doing uh, internal critiques, very, very important. Uh, I, I think that those are two uh, great points there. Somebody that recently you've been on with that I think, um, and by the way, none of this is personal. You always say this, that when, when you debate, you know, the, the debate is one thing, but after is, is another, and it's, it's, it's not personal, but somebody that I did see who did have, at least to me, have some cognitive dissonance was, uh, I don't know, I don't know her name exactly, but she goes on uh, Fresh and Fit quite a bit. It was the 3v1 that you had um, uh, uh, with the, the three ladies. I think Nina was on there. Um, and it was just incredible to see I Lauren mean, the arguments that you made. Yeah, uh, you're talking about Lauren, really, right? Really, really backed her into a corner. Go ahead. You're talking about Lauren. Yes, correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she did. But that's the thing is that when called out, instead of her even taking the time to think about what I said, the best she could come up with was that I must have failed at geometry when I was in <laughs> high school or in yeah. college, because after all, she has perfect geometry degrees. So she knows how to structure a logical argument, which, of course, is the most illogical thing I've ever heard. Right. Yeah. But, but she didn't understand the distinction. Right. So, so try to understand like that is a great example of, of cognitive dissonance in real time Yes, and then doubling down on it. And still to this day, she'll double down on it rather than uh, even have an admission that, th that they're wrong. I say this all the time. I have lost debates. I have even lost public debates. And the way I see it is like a boxer. Okay. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'm, si maybe yeah. I'm 60 and oh, all right. Uh, but then maybe I'm, I'm 62 and three. Right. You know, like you don't you don't know how this is going to play out. It's like depends on the topic and the person. Uh, and I will lose debates in the future. But the point is, is right. to be the very best that I possibly can be refine it the best that I possibly can so that I am delivering the ideas in the best way for our side that they can possibly be delivered. And yeah. that's what's really important. You got to yeah. deliver the best way possible. Even if you lose, you want to make sure that that margin was pretty narrow. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that way, if you do come back and you go back at it, you win the next time. It's like, and that happens in boxing too. Sometimes you lose right. a match and you come back and beat the tar out of the guy. So, um, exactly. you just, but never be afraid of that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's very important, uh, to, uh, sometimes it is, uh, really helpful or beneficial to lose because mm -hmm. then you can really critique yourself and ask what you did wrong. And then you can come back stronger, especially when we're talking about intellectual discussions uh, and convincing people of our worldview. That's a good thing for us to be able to refine it and refine it and refine it until it's just a, a really, really, really well said argument. Um, uh, for Lauren specifically, and I've seen this across YouTube that I really don't, um, I don't personally understand. I, I think I've heard Rolo, I, and maybe this is the answer to, I've heard Rolo Tomasi say that, um, that everybody who's born in the West, uh, especially women, they have a, at, at the very least a little bit of feminism in them. And, you know, with Lauren, you know, she says that she's conservative and it's not just a uh, uh, Lauren thing. I've seen other individuals uh, like this as well. Uh, and it's like, I, I just don't really understand how one can be traditional or conservative when you don't really believe the fundamentals and foundations of marriage. 
Uh, and I think that we are seeing this a lot. So I'm I'm glad that that you were able to have that discussion uh, with them. And I think you did a great job. So, Andrew, I think the last uh, couple of questions I have for you, we're, we'll go back to uh, Trump here. And I, I really did want to ask you this. Is there reason for optimism or is America in decline and perhaps Christians like myself and you should focus more on our faith and spreading the word, I suppose, focusing on changing the culture and consciousness of American citizens rather than focusing on politics? This is a million dollar question. And the answer to it is there's great hope, great, awesome. great hope. And let me walk you through what that hope is. The secularists are not breeding. They're not having children. If you look at the birth rate, while it's deteriorating rapidly, understand that the people who are having the most amount of children are the most religious. Right. So this is a both and proposition. For you, yes, the, the ideal is continue to focus on faith, continue to focus on family, continue to focus on spreading the good word and eliminating progressive ideology everywhere you can find it. But most importantly, focus on this. Focus on four kids, focus on six kids, focus on eight kids, focus on breeding the enemy out because we can. We are actually at a junction where this is possible. The decline trends by the UN estimate just a few years ago was that there would be a decline after we hit 10 billion people that has been massively revised. We're now at the point where China is projected to, by the middle of this century, lose 500 million people or half of its population. The Japanese, for the first time, are opening up their doors for limited immigration, which has never happened in their history because they have such an elder care crisis, which is going on. This is a global thing, which we're, we haven't even begun to contend with yet. And we have been at the forefront of it in the understanding that based on these trends and what's going to happen going forward, we have a real shot here. Yeah. Our shot is not never think of this as our generation is going to be able to win this. We can't. And Agreed. perhaps not even the next generation can. But the generation after that really has a great shot. If you instill the same ideological values that you currently hold right now into a large family, your secularist enemy is not going to do that, which means that the future literally does belong to us right. if we move in that direction. So is there hope? Yeah, there's great hope. Great hope. Uh, absolutely. Not only are we not out of the fight, but we're really just beginning it. Yes. And it's like now that we can see the ideology for ourselves, we do have purpose. Your purpose in life, your purpose in dr being driven in this life should be marriage and children and the instillment of those values to the next generation. And we will win the culture war. We will. Just by the numbers, we will. Right. And when you raise those children, remember to tell them to get jobs in institution fields. Tell them to get jobs as teachers. Tell them to take their ideology out to the world, too. Don't tell them to separate themselves from it. Tell yes. them to take it over, right? Tell them to take it yeah, over. Absolutely. And have them remember base dad who took them out shooting and fishing and told yes. them how the world worked and told them this is your mission in life is to take this shit over. Right. So yeah, man, I have that a lot of is hope, that is beautifully, beautifully said, Andrew. I I absolutely love that, and I concur to the fullest. Uh, it's it's re it really is a numbers game, and you know the the fact of the matter is, uh, Orthodox Christians are absolutely uh, and Christians in general, but I specifically Orthodox Christians are having the families. They are uh, breeding the next uh, generation. Um, so I, man, that was really, really well said. My last question for you, Andrew, is what would you say are maybe, maybe, and you did kind of touch upon it already, but what would you say are, maybe we'll go with three, the three ba biggest issues facing America? Oh man. <laughs> um, the, there's, there's, uh, I'm going to answer the question directly, but I want to say that there's a bit of a kind of um, a presuppositional misunderstanding here. There's a cultural, what I, what I would call like a cultural gish gallop or a legislative gish gallop yeah. where there's so much being fired at us at, at, at one time. And all of it is equally important that, that trying to actually divvy it up into portions of what's the most important versus right. what's not the most important is insanely difficult to do. Yes. But if you're going to kind of look at it from what are these kind of core ideologies which are the most detrimental the first is rebellion to god yeah that is the very first and foremost detrimental ideology which the west suffers from 
The second is egalitarianism, which comes from rebellion to God. And the third is feminism, which comes from a rebellion to the first two. Egalitarianism can only be embraced by men who understand from a patriarchal perspective. They understand that there can be no egalitarianism. They can only do this in rebellion to God because God works within a hierarchy. There is no doubt that that is true. Why he prefers to work within a hierarchical structure, I have no idea, neither does anybody else, but it doesn't matter. We are reflections of that hierarchical structure that he works within, and therefore we also work within one. Our rejection of God leads us to a degradation in the patriarchal system in which yes. we all swim in the very air that we breathe. Because of this, the poisons like feminism or all secondary issues come from rebellion to God and a shrugging off of our patriarchal duty for egalitarianism. So I would say that there's really two core issues and everything else is a runner up with maybe feminism being at the, the top runner up, yes, right? Yes, but yes, still, yes. but still just a poisonous, uh, still just a, a, a poison, uh, which exists as a drip off these two main knives. So, so, uh, Andrew, I know I said last question, would you call your, consider yourself a complementarian versus as opposed to the egalitarian? Okay. No, I'm a patriarchist, 100%. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. And yeah, I, I would and say I one, I 100%. Oh, well, I think I think that what you would consider complementarianism also would rely on a patriarchal structure no matter yes. what. In order for men to be complementary to each other or even act within the spirit of cooperation or women with men, this is always going to be within a hierarchy. The hierarchy yes. will always exist regardless of what our thoughts are about it because it must exist. This is the nature of men and women. This is not negotiable. This is not something we can negotiate our way out of, think our way out of, transcend right. our nature away it's from. It's the order of things. It is the way that the descriptive is, is. So yes, I understand that because this is the way it exists, whether it ought to or not, it always will. And therefore, I'm going to tailor my life around what is true and what is real versus whether or not I would prefer to wear a cape and fly around like Superman has no bearing on if I can or not. All right, guys, uh, that is going to be it. I think Andrew absolutely killed it uh, today. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on my channel. It was awesome to have you. I really do hope I can have you again down the line. Um, his channel, of course, is The Crucible. Is there any other information that you would like to give out, Andrew? Yeah, follow. you can follow me on Twitter at PaleoChristCon, and I would appreciate that follow. As you know, there's a lot going on on Twitter at the moment. And that is fast becoming yet another one of these battlefronts, which we need to be on and we need to be on it quick because uh, right now, this is probably one of the largest spaces for the domain of speech. And it's where you're going to find most of these ideologies and you can change a lot of minds there. So make sure to go there. Um, and if you guys have good suggestions for people for me to follow on Twitter or to talk to, I'm happy to do that. And I don't care. Again, let me reiterate this. I don't care about your channel size. A lot of times people will, will kind of, um, they'll, they'll give me a call or uh, discord me or DM me and say, look, man, you know, I only have like a, a hundred subscribers or 120 subscribers. I'm really trying to grow, but I like the message and I want to be a part of it. I want to help you do that. Like that's my, that's my goal is to help smaller creators. There wasn't anybody helping me do that. Right? right. So, I mean, that's the goal though, is I think first and foremost, the ideology needs to be put front square in front of people. And uh, we need to get everybody who possibly will come on board on board. So uh, with that, let me graciously thank you so much for the uh, interview and uh, having me on your channel. I appreciate it very much. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Be sure to hit the like button, share, and definitely subscribe, Andrew. Thank you so much and hope to talk to you again.